Okay, now we're going. We're live. All right, so just to finish up um, some of the terminology from the, the sinusoids, um, in standard transformation form, A, B, C, D, A is still your vertical dilation factor, B is still your horizontal dilation factor, A is still, if it's negative, a x-axis reflection, B is still a y-axis reflection, C is still a horizontal shift, and D is still your vertical shift. Okay, nothing's changed in that respect. But they have new meanings. They take on new meanings in this wave uh, function. A, the absolute value of A is your amplitude, right? Amplitude, what's another, how do we define amplitude? The height, yeah, it's your wave height. So that's gonna be the distance, the positive distance that we go above the sinusoidal axis and below the sinusoidal axis to hit our high point and low point respectively. And we put the absolute value around it because of course, if it's negative, it reflects across the x-axis. Now, the absolute value of B, the magnitude of B, so your horizontal dilation factor, but it's the number of cycles in two pi. That's important for you to memorize. That's why I put an asterisk by it. B, bless you, is the number of cycles in two pi. And by default, we talked about this yesterday, the default amplitude is one, but the B value is default to one as well. So we see one cycle between zero and two pi, and that's how we get the definition of the period, right? The period is the wavelength. It's the length of one cycle, okay? And uh, it's two pi by default. Uh, we talked about the difference between period and frequency, right? Yesterday, here it is again. Period says, I want to focus in on one cycle. I want to look at the critical values of one cycle and I want it to be spread out large enough so I can appreciate every little detail. Now, if it takes one radian or a thousand radians for that cycle to complete, I don't care. The length of that cycle is the period. We're focusing in on one cycle. Frequency is the reciprocal of that. Frequency says, I'm going to establish a, a set time or a set distance in radians, like one radian or two radians. And now I'm going to count how many cycles occur in that time span or in that distance. Okay, so the reciprocals. Period is measured in radians per cycle, radians per one cycle, and frequency is cycles per radian or cycles per second. Okay, so they're reciprocals of each other. Um, and that's what I wrote up there. All right, so C is still your horizontal shift, but we call it the phase shift. We talked about that yesterday, like the moon waxes and wanes, uh, and we call it the phases. So if you, if you hear phase shift, that's a horizontal shift. D is still your vertical shift, but it's also the location of your sinusoidal axis. Your sinusoidal axis is always gonna be at Y equals D. And that's important because when we start sketching these dudes, that's one of the first things that we plot. We put our sinusoidal axis in first because it's gonna be our frame of reference. And once we have that established, then we can go up A to the high point and down A to the low point, okay? So Y equals D. Um, all right, and then of course the period is the length of one cycle. Now let's, let's talk about B again. B is still your horizontal dilation factor. If B were two, what would that do? Would that be a horizontal stretch or compression? It'd be a horizontal compression, right? So based upon what the definition of B is, we'll now see two cycles from zero to two pi instead of just one. And that makes perfect sense, right? Because if we're compressing it by a factor of two, we get two in the same space where there was one, okay? Now, does that mean the period is two? No, B is not the period, but B affects the period, right? B is related to the period. We get the B value from the equation. But when we sketch the graph, we want the period, okay? So what happens to the period then that used to be two pi if we've now made it half as big? It's one pi, right? So from zero to one pi, we see the first cycle. And from one pi to two pi, we see the second cycle, okay? So that's what if B were two. What if B were one half? That would be a horizontal what? Stretch. So now the graph is twice as wide, right? So according to the definition of B, we are now going to see only a half of a cycle from zero to two pi, which makes sense, right? What would be the period now? What would be the length of one cycle if we made it twice as wide? It'd be four pi, get it? So B is not the period, but it's related to the period. Here's the equation for finding the period. Simple. The period is the default distance for a cycle, two pi, and we divide it by 
the number of partitions we want, the number of cycles we want. That's how you do anything, right? If you have a certain distance and you want to divide it evenly into a certain number of things, it's the distance divided by that number. That's what this is here. The default distance is two pi. And of course we put the absolute values around it because we don't want B to be negative, okay? So that's, that's what we do to get the graph. Now, later on, I'm gonna be giving you the graph and I'm gonna be asking you to write the equation. So mathematically, those two guys can just change places. If you have the graph and you wanna find the value of B, it's two pi over the period, okay? They're interchangeable. So you gotta know that. B and P are not the same. But there's two sides of the same coin. All right, um, let's go ahead and meet the other sinusoid. And instead of making a table of values, I'm just going to get down to the real skinny of it right here. The other sinusoid is cosine, cosine. Cosine looks a whole heck of a lot like sine. What does it share with sine? Well, it's obviously a wave function, okay? Don't be rude, wave back. Okay, let it be noted that they two thirds of the class are waving back. Yeah. The other third are passively objecting um, in support of Ukraine. It has a domain of all real numbers, right? Just like sine. And it oscillates between negative one and one. So it has a range of negative one to one, just like sine. Okay. There are a couple of differences. Oh, what else is similar to sine? The period is two pi, just like sine, which makes sense because it's once around the unit circle. Now the two main differences are this. Number one, cosine at zero starts high instead of on the axis, because what is cosine of zero? One, cosine of zero is one, okay? This would be pi halves. What is cosine of pi halves? Zero, what's cosine of pi? Negative one, what's cosine of three pi halves? Zero, and what's cosine of two pi? One, so that's really the only difference, okay? Cosine starts at a high point. So for the five critical values for one cycle, it's high, axis low, axis high. It starts high, it ends high. That one's a little bit easier to measure than sine because it's just crest to crest, right? instead of axis point to the second axis point. So the mnemonic or cosine's nickname, if you will, is Chala, Chala, cosine, C for Chala, high axis low, axis high, five critical values. Everyone say, hi Chala. Hi Chala, hi Chala. Right, so we have Sahala and Chala. Sahala, sine, Chala, cosine, okay? Now, the other difference besides the starting value is the symmetry. Let's talk about that real quickly. Sine, remember, was an odd function. It had origin symmetry. Turn your iPad upside down 180 degrees, it's the same. Cosine has origin symmetry also, question mark? No, if you turn this upside down, the high point becomes the low point. So that's not the same. But does it have the other type of symmetry? And what is that symmetry? Y-axis symmetry, does it have it? Yes, it does have the folding symmetry. If you fold it on the y-axis, it'll coincide. So it does have y-axis symmetry. Let's write that down. Y-axis symmetry, which means it's what type of function? Even. Odd functions are origin symmetric, even functions are y-axis symmetric. Now, the algebraic consequence of that is this. This is important. That means cosine of negative x, remember now where x is the angle in radians, is equal to cosine of positive x. For odd functions, we said yesterday, opposite inputs gave you opposite outputs. But for even function, Opposite inputs give you the same output, right? You could tell right here. What is cosine of pi halves? Zero. What is cosine of negative pi halves? Also zero. What is cosine of pi? Negative one. What's cosine of negative pi? Also negative one, right? Because of the symmetry, 
If it's the same distance away from the y-axis, it's going to have the same y value. Now that's going to be important when we start sketching transformations of these things because a negative b value is going to do what to the graph? It's going to reflect it across the y-axis. Well, if it's an even function, do we really need to reflect it across the y-axis? <laughs> do we need to? No, because it's going to look the same, right? So that's why we're going to say, oh, you want me to reflect it across the x-axis? I did. <laughs> you can't tell. I did. I'm just going to not do it and pretend I did, right? Whereas if it's a sine function, if it's a sine function and we have a negative input around the X, instead of reflecting it across the Y axis, which is gonna be harder to graph as you'll see, all we're gonna do is pull it out front and instead reflect it across the X axis. Yeah, which is a lot easier to do. Wow, okay. Let's go ahead and sketch our first dude. Let's jump down to example five. Okay, example five. Ray sketch transformation. All right, it says sketch three positive cycles, okay, of this function. F of X is two cosine of three times X, all right? Three positive cycles. Let's make this little note right here before we start sketching the first one. I'm always gonna want you to do this. Always, always, always sketch at least, at a bare minimum, one negative critical value. Always wanna sketch at least one negative critical value. I'm gonna call those CVs, okay? The reason we always want to have at least one negative critical value is because that's going to guarantee when we sketch it that we show it crossing the y-axis. And when we get to the word problems, like tomorrow with the intern, that's going to be your initial value. For all of the problems that you talk about, when it crosses the y-axis, that's when time, t, equals zero. So that's the starting value, the y-intercept, okay? All right. Um, so let's take a look at this. The first thing that we do is say, okay, What's the parent function to this f of x? Is it e to the x? I'm guessing. Is the parent function natural log of x? I'm guessing again. Oh, it's cosine. Oh, yeah. Okay, good. So the parent function is cosine. So I'm going to come over here and write that. The parent function is chala, right? Cosine of x, also known as chala. All right. Chala. Now that I got the parent function identified, we need to say, is it in standard transformation form? No. no? Yeah. No, yeah, or yeah, no? I think, yeah, yeah, right? Yeah, it is. There's really nothing to, there, there's no thing, nothing's added or subtracted. So the value of C is zero and the value of D is zero, right? There's nothing added or subtracted. So this is your A value. And this is your B value. Now, if you want, you can put parentheses around 3x. That helps you see the inside, doesn't it? That's our angle. Our angle is 3x, all right? So let's go ahead and describe what each of these does just in general. All right, what does the two do? It's a vertical stretch. We'll put an asterisk here. Vertical stretch by a factor of what? Two. All right, we've taken the graph, whatever it is, and we stretch it vertically by a factor of two. And what would the three do? It would be a horizontal compression by a factor of three. Yeah. Now that's that's the description that we wrote back in the day with any old plain old Jane old function, right? But in this case, we can reinterpret that in terms of the wave function. So if the a value is two, we can say that the amplitude is two, right? The amplitude is two. So what does that mean for us when we're sketching it? If I know where my sinusoidal axis is, I can from that horizontal value go up two to the high point, down two to the low point, up two to the high point, down two to the low point, all right? And of course, if b is three, what's the interpretation of that? How many cycles am I going to see between zero and two pi? 
three. Previously, I saw one, but if I'm compressing it by a factor, yeah, we're going to see three cycles in zero to two pi. Okay, three of them. Cool. Now, once you have put it into standard transformation form, you've collected this information, the next thing that you're going to want to do is this. You want to find P. You want to find the period, okay? We get B from the equation, but we need P to graph it, okay? So remember the formula is two pi over the absolute value of B. So if I plug in, I get two pi over what? Three. That doesn't simplify, does it? No. So guess what the new period is? Guess what, guess what the new length or wavelength is for one cycle? Two pi thirds. And it should make sense, because watch. From zero, from zero to two pi thirds, we see the first cycle. From two pi thirds to four pi thirds, we see the second cycle. And then from four pi thirds to six pi thirds, we see the third cycle. Well, six pi thirds is just what? Two pi. All right. I think we're ready to sketch it, right? This is gonna be an easy one to sketch because there is no horizontal shift. If there's ever a horizontal shift or a phase shift, that one's gonna be a little bit different, okay? But this one, we're ready to go. So. Let's come over here now and uh, we're gonna create the graph. So give yourself a Y axis, snap it if you can. I'm not real good at that. Oh. Third time's a charm, there we go. Wanna, wanna make it bigger. Ah, I don't know what I'm doing. Ah, ah, let's redraw it. Okay, there we go. Now. Uh, because I want three positive cycles, right? Most of my information I want to graph on the right-hand side. So I'm just going to draw a horizontal axis like that. And I might actually move my vertical axis over a little bit more, okay? You want to give yourself plenty of distance on the right-hand side. I'll always make you sketch at least one cycle, always, and always at least one negative critical value. But this one said to have three positives, right? So... Once we have our axes, guess what we do? We set the table. You set the table before you eat, right? Set the table. Do we do that anymore or do we just eat? Yeah, we just rip open the bags from the fat and eat, right? But back in the day, you actually, when you set the table, you had to put down plates, you had to put down silverware, you have to put down napkins and ask everybody, what do you want to drink, right? Yeah. Set the table. For us, setting the table is getting the X and Y axes all labeled, okay? The only things I wanna see on your graph are the sinusoidal axis, the high point, the low point, and the critical values on the X axis. That's it, okay? So the vertical axis is the easier of the two to label. So let's do that first. Step one, where's your sinusoidal axis? That's the first thing that we look for when we do the vertical axis. Well, remember it's at Y equals D. What's our D value here? Did we shift it up or down at all? No, so guess what? It's Y equals zero, also known as the X axis. So I'm gonna go ahead and put it on there. I'll choose, I'll choose red and I'll make it a little bit uh, thicker. And I know you can do dotted lines, but I'm not gonna do that. It takes too long for me to switch. So I'm just gonna put a dotted line on the X axis, right? There's your sinusoidal axis. It's not a horizontal asymptote. It's just a reference line. It's an imaginary reference line, okay? Now, once we have that, now we can go using the amplitude, we can go up to and down to. So whatever distance you call to from the sinusoidal axis, which is this right here, that's the distance that you need to try to preserve right here. And again, you're just eyeballing it. You don't have to get out a ruler or anything, okay? Answers will vary, right? I don't care how high you go, but whatever you do above, you wanna keep that distance below, okay? So they're setting up the, the vertical axis, the Y axis. Now the X axis is always a lot more fun. Always a lot more fun. If I need to squeeze in three full cycles over here, let's see, um, one, two, 
three. Okay, so one is gonna have to land somewhere around right here. So come out right there, ish, ish, right? And label that the period. What's the period? Two pi thirds, yeah. Now here's what you do. Once you have your mark down for one cycle on your paper, bisect that distance and then take half the number. What's half of two pi thirds? Yeah, two pi six, which simplifies to one pi third. How do you take half of a fraction? There's two ways. To take half of a fraction, you either half the numerator if it's even, or if it's not, you double the denominator. Those are the two easy ways. So what's half of two pi thirds? One pi thirds. Or what's half of two pi thirds? Two pi six, which simplifies to pi thirds. All right, now that's your half cycle. We do it one more time, bisect that distance, and then take half of pi thirds, which is what? Pi six. Now guess what? There is no more important X value for this function than that number there, pi six. That's your quarter cycle counting interval. And you can always find it by bisecting twice, which helps you set up your axis, or you could do this. What's one fourth of the period? Well, that's one fourth of two pi thirds, which simplifies to pi six. We need to know the quarter cycle counting interval because that's the distance between axis high, axis low, axis high, axis low, axis high, axis low. All right. Now, here's why it's important on your graph. Whatever this distance is here, that's the distance that you need to preserve now the best you can between successive critical values. Now I could do one more here easily. I can bisect that distance. But notice now past two pi thirds, I'm just gonna eyeball it. I'm gonna take that distance from zero to pi six and I'm just gonna add marks until I run out of space, okay? So you're just eyeballing it. Eyeball, 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 eyeball. Eyeball, you ball. We all ball for eyeball. All right. And of course, zero is still a critical value. That's important. And now we go out to the left. Eyeball. There's my one, but I have room. I might as well use it. Eyeball, eyeball, right? Man, it's almost like we're uh, at a store on Halloween shopping, right? And we're going down our shopping list. Eyeball, eyeball, eyeball. Bad Halloween joke. Mm. Did we set the table? Not quite, not quite. Because guess what we need to do now? All of those marks, we need to label them. Yeah. And this is where it's fun. Pi six, they're all pi six apart. So let's just go through and count by pi, one pi six, and we'll simplify as we go. You ready? You ready? I'm ready. One pi six, got it. Two pi six, I heard. The next one would be three pi six, which is what? Pi halves. Four pi six, which is two pi thirds. Five pi six. The next one is six pi six, which is what? Pi. Seven pi six doesn't simplify. Eight pi six simplifies to four pi thirds. Nine pi six simplifies to three pi halves. 10 pi six simplifies to five pi thirds. 11 pi six simplifies to nothing. And 12 pi six simplifies to two pi. And there's my three cycles. Well, what the heck? I have one more critical value. What would come next? Lucky number 13 pi six. Yes, yes. So see what we're doing? We're just counting by pi six and we're simplifying as we go. That's a good mental activity right there in and of itself, right? Counting and simplifying fractions in your head, right? That's a transferable life skill. Now, if you can't simplify them in your head as you go, where do you go to simplify them? 
off to the side on your workbench. Yeah, on your workbench. Yep. Now we still have some negative guys to label. So here's zero. And now we got negative one pi six, negative two pi six is negative pi thirds, negative three pi six is negative pi halves. So notice now those are the same numbers as on the right. They're just negative. Okay. We have finally set the table. We have set the table. Is it time to eat? Almost, almost, almost. Depending on how you serve, if you've ever eaten from a table that's set, sometimes you serve in the kitchen, or we're gonna say, hey, we set the table before we can eat. We don't eat right out of the dishes, right? The serving dishes, do we? we sometimes. I mean, it is 2022, right? It's not like leave it to beaver, right? 1950, you put the food from the serving dish onto your plate and then you eat, okay? Let's do that. Proverbially here, when we put the food from the serving tray or dish onto our plate, it's putting down our critical values. This is where it matters whether it was sine or cosine. Because up to now, I wasn't even thinking, is it sine or cosine? I wasn't. But what was it? It was a cosine, wasn't it? What's the nickname for cosine? Chala. So at zero, we start where? High axis or low? High. So we're going to put our critical values down. High. And now we've got it, right? Axis, low, axis, high. Axis, low, axis, high. Axis, low, axis, high. Axis. And now we work back to the left, right? It would be axis, low, axis. And if we had more points, we would just continue. Now the food is on the plate. Now we can say grace, right? Dear Descartes, thank you for your coordinate plane, for you give us coordinate geometry. Um, let your math be nourishment to our bodies and our bodies in service of mathematics. Okay. Now we connect the dots, right? We connect the dots with quarter cycle arcs. Don't use straight lines. Exaggerate the curve. Quarter cycle symmetrical arcs. Don't use straight lines. And then you extend it past the last one you draw with a little arrow. There's it, we got it. Three positive cycles plus a little extra and at least one negative point with a little extra. There's the graph, okay? Isn't that amazing? It's beautiful. What's the range of this function? Negative two to two, right? We can get that pretty easily. That's just our D value minus the amplitude for the low point and a D value plus two for the high point. What's the domain? All real numbers, right? And what's the period? It's still two pi thirds, very good. Still two pi thirds. Pi axis, low axis, high. There's one cycle, okay? Now that's, we're not gonna jump into example six, but example six we'll do on Friday. We shifted horizontally. When you shift it horizontally, you have to be careful because your critical values may be different. All right. So the last thing I'll do here just to tie this up, sine and cosine look pretty much the same. If I were to sketch sine here, axis high, axis low, axis. You got to reprint your SAT ticket real quickly. Look, if I sketch sine on the same graph as cosine, it's just phase shifted from the one to the other by pi halves. I can pick cosine up and move it right pi halves or sign up and move it left pi halves. That's really the only difference. They're out of phase with each other. All right, make sure you reprint your SAT ticket.